Um, please welcome Alfred, the director, Alfred George Bailey, and the producer, Amelia Davis. Executive producer. <laughs> I do apologize. Tatiana Kennedy was the producer. Okay. Um, <coughs> maybe I'll start with you, Alfred, if, if I may. Um, just maybe if you could tell us um, a bit about your own background and what attracted you to this project and what you knew about Jim prior to it, it's, you know, and what you learned and so on. Right. And how you met Amelia. The whole, how, did wow. all, how did it all kind of... How did it all come about? So you got a guy's got about five, six hours. <laughs> we'll get some quilts and no. Um, background is music. Um, I was a drummer. I want to make a really edited version. So I was drumming, and I always loved photography and I always loved film, but I never really had the confidence to get into film. But I always loved photography, and I started taking pictures while I was a drummer. And eventually, at some point, I moved into the um into the world of uh film through people being very kind and um meeting some mentors who would mentor me and help me to have the confidence to move forward in what i do now uh how i met amelia was i was this is jumping a huge amount forward i was invited to an event by Leica because i'm a Leica ambassador and they invited me to an event the launch of a book called Jazz Festivals, which is Jim, one of Jim's amazing books. And the head of Leica UK was Jason Heward, and he invited me to, to this event and sent me an email. And I saw this picture of Miles Davis and um, Steve McQueen. I thought, this is a bit odd. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come. And I went. And I remember going to the um, Leica Gallery, which was in Mayfair. And at the time, it's moved. Um, the gallery's in an attic, in this really amazing attic with a high roof. And when I walked up the stairs, the first thing that greeted me, and you go into the gallery, was an amazing picture of Miles Davis. And then the next picture was Cannonball Adderley. And the next picture was, uh, you, you see where I'm going? And there was these amazing photographs. And they were all Jim Marshalls. And I had my nose pressed up against the glass, looking at these wonderful black and white images that were just so beautifully... <laughs> The framing, the printing was incredible. The blacks were so deep. And I just thought, these are, these images are amazing. And like I'm sure some of the um, the people who have been into, who we, I interviewed said that, you know, it was like you're looking at a snapshot of history or a snapshot of, uh, of, of just life going on without anybody realizing that there's somebody there. And Jim was invisible. And these pictures were incredible. And we got introduced and... Uh, uh, Jay, and he said, well, I'd love to introduce you to Alfred, his Amelia. And uh, he said he's made a documentary about uh, Gregory Porter, which I did, my first film. And uh, we exchanged details and cutting a long story short, Amelia promised to watch the film and get in touch. And two weeks later she did. And, uh, and the email was really funny because Amelia wrote in the email, I'm not sure if you're interested. But we've been trying to make a documentary on Jim Marshall, and I thought, this is ridiculous. And when are you available to talk? And I said, well, you know, I'm available. And then we spoke, and um, for the first two months, I kept asking her, are you sure you want me to make the film? And she said, it's too late, you're in. And then we, we started, and it was uh, an amazing journey. But as we both said, this is not just us, it's the whole team. And we had a great editor who's in the audience. He's in the audience. He's in the audience. I'm not going to hail him. Well, I am actually. Not Adam. Stand up. Adam. Stand <laughs> he's up. not going to stand up. I know no. he will, but he's shaking his head. So oh. he's making himself known. But Adam did an amazing job, and he gave so much of himself to this film. And and it's really great when you have someone who really cares about what he does as his craft as an editor, and cares about Jim. And he looked and at every single. Proof sheet, every <laughs> single frame. It was amazing. Yeah, so he dedicated a lot of his time. And um, Ian Arbor, the, the um, composer, because of the 32-piece orchestra there. And uh, Dennis Mabry was helping Adam, and Dennis was great. I mean, without him as well. There's lots of glue here that helped make this film. And the problem when you have a film like this, it's very open, it's exposed. So there's, if there's any issues, they'll be right there in front of you to see. But 
with all the help and the dedication, Amelia and Benino, I mean, they were incredible scanning images. And when we went to San Francisco, I'll tell a quick story. We sat down and we were going through images and we broke for lunch and we came back and I thought we'd done like four or five draws. We were only on draw two of the proof sheets because we'd gone through like so many and they were on these proof sheets were killer amazing shots and Jim's hit rate is ridiculous. I mean, if you had a roll of 30 sticks, you'd know about, I think 34, 32 of them would be killer shots and the rest are good shots that some people would call their good shots. So it was it was really the the hard thing is what we had to leave out. Adam and I at the time we had a little <coughs> we had a little moment <coughs> in the edit where we had we had all these really amazing Rolling Stones images and we had to make the choice which ones we were gonna choose, but because he shot so many incredible shots, it's really hard, it's very difficult. And you have to remember he shot with no flash and available light. And Jim understood his 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 kit. Was Jim trained, by the way? I mean, you, you've not really Amelia. sort of... Um, yeah, maybe, Amelia, you could talk about that because you worked with him so long. I mean, did he actually... The technique is, is so incredible in the film. So it's not just about the access, is it? I mean, it's also no. about this incredible technical facility as well. Could you, yeah. could you talk a little bit about that and his early career and how he started as a photographer? Yeah, Jim... Jim, Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, Jim was completely self-taught. So he went out and literally bought a Leica... Oh. Um, and then just started taking photographs in San Francisco. And this was about 1959. So in San Francisco, North Beach was really the hub for jazz. Um, and Miles Davis and John Coltrane were there. And so Jim just started taking photographs and he figured everything out himself. So he knew his camera so well at, at one point after he just started seeing what worked and what didn't that it became a part of him. And so, I mean, it was these were hard shots to start out with when you're in a jazz club with no light, you know, a spotlight. Um, you had a lot of African American musicians in black suits, so it's really hard when you're taking black and white photographs of them. Um, but Jim just taught himself, and he then went out into the streets and photographed what was going on around there as well in North Beach, which was still the beatnik era, mm -hmm. and it was just starting to come into, you know, the counterculture and and different things. Um, but it, I think it was through his early self-taught um, kind of in-the-moment uh, spaces. So whether it was in a jazz club or it was street photography, he really was able to capture a moment and do that so well that then he took that into his music photography. So when he was doing live shots, it never really felt like you were in a pit looking up at a guy with a microphone. It felt like you were there on stage with them. Um, and he really captured that very moment in those pieces of history. So that really prepared him, and he developed a style that stayed with him for the rest of his life, and that's what a lot of people thought of Jim Marshall was, um, just capturing pieces of history. And Jim even said, I was a, I was a historian with a camera, basically. So he was photographing pieces of history and never thought of himself as a music photographer. He thought of himself as a photojournalist. Tended to shoot in black. He may preferred black and white generally. I mean, he it's not all black and white, is it? But no, mostly? he loved he loved black and white, and yeah. so he shot with Kodak Tri-X 400. Um, but he also shot color, and he he shot slide film. So he did ektachrome and Kodachrome, yeah. and that was mainly for a lot of the album covers that he had to do. But he his real love was black and white because you just have that very personal um, feeling to it, and you felt like you were there. And so uh, a question really for both of you. I mean, it must have been, uh, I mean, this is a very multifaceted, in, multifaceted individual and it must have been very hard. I mean, what sort of decisions were you making early on about what was actually going to go in the film, what you, what you would leave out? I mean, I was very, I didn't know anything about the, the poverty in America, for example, sure. this whole kind of social documentarian sort of um, aspect to his work, which seems to, you know, has been slightly occluded by these, these incredible shots of uh, musicians and the yeah. jazz greats. So maybe just talk a little bit about that as well. And that's the thing, I mean, and I will definitely hand over to Amelia. It was a personal journey for me knowing and discovering all this stuff that he had done, which has nothing to do with music, nothing to do with that rock and roll, if you want to do quote unquote, or jazz scene or folk scene or whatever. It, <laughs> I think he would have been an incredible just documentarian as a street photographer. I mean, just as a just as a historian, 
and just going out there, going into places where people didn't want to go. And the thing with Jim was we, as Amelia knows, and as a lot of people knew him back then, he could, Jim could be of a hell's angel and they'll love him. He could be of a jazz musician, they'll love him. A beatnik, country, folk. He could literally be, it's almost like a zealot kind of figure where anywhere he went, he could sort of like morph and, and, and be liked and be uh, taken in and trusted. And it wasn't fake, just Jim, he just generated that at that time of his life, so. He was authentic, and yeah. he, he could tell the people that he was with, and he made them feel really at ease, so then they forgot that he had a camera. <laughs> so they were very natural, and he was able to capture those moments. Um, but yeah, I think Jim was, was, that set him apart from the other photographers of that time, because a lot of the photograph music photographers of that time were there for the music. So they would photograph the music, it was over, they would put their cameras away. Whereas Jim wouldn't, he would keep his camera and he'd venture into the streets and the neighborhoods and start photographing everything else that was around it. So I think that's really, he had a very curious eye. And I think that's what set him apart, <coughs> is that he was always documenting, he felt like he had to, it was just a part of himself. And um, I met him later in life, but even then, when he would go to the grocery store, he would take his Leica and put it around his neck. It was just habit that he never wanted to miss something that happened. And, uh, and, and I think we're lucky that, that he was that way. He must have been quite an astute businessman because he managed to retain copyright in, in everything that he shot. Is, is that right? I mean, how did he manage to do that when he was, do, you know, he was being commissioned on assignments for album covers and by presumably by record yeah. labels, et cetera? How d I mean, he was ahead of his time, I think. And um, what he, he knew early on was that he wanted to retain his copyright. So he was never a work for hire, he never did a buyout, he even says it in the documentary. So that meant that as he got older, he never had any children. He thought, you know, his photos were his children. So he took care of them when he was alive and he said, uh, you know, as I get older, they will take care of me. And by being able to, you know, have retained that copyright, they did take care of him because a lot of these famous life photographers that shot for Life or Look magazine were work for hires. Therefore, they did not retain the copyrights. And so it's kind of an incredible thing that Jim had the foresight to, to do that. And I think it's also a thing where they, when you, I think you're just lucky to be, get the work. So if you're really pleased that something you've been taken on by, uh, you know, like an organization like Magnum, which owns all of your work, you don't own it. Once you join them, you're, you're a part of your Magnum photographer or you're a Getty photographer. There's one other photographer who I know who, who like Jim, who came to the screening at the Albert Hall. Um, um, a friend of mine, he owns all of his own copyright, Richard Young, and he's the, he, it's really funny, he said that, he loved that about the film, he said, I, he didn't know he did that, and he said, that's what I do, I don't, they don't, they don't own any negatives. He said when he was young, he would go into um, Joe's basement at the time, which is a very famous place where every, all the journalists and photographers used to go, and um, he, 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 he had his negatives there, and he thought, he just grabbed them, and he just said no. You can print them, and you can have this sort of like a contact sheet to look at and choose what you want, but you don't own the negatives, and that's and that's the thing. Jim Jim amazingly kept kept his copyright, which I think is incredible. That he knew back then this is going to look after me. But he also, I think, uh, we had talked about this a little bit earlier. He also um, would go out and get stories mm. and then pitch it to magazines. So um, you know. Poverty in America, the Hazard Kentucky stuff, that was his idea and he pitched it to a magazine to go do it. So it, it wasn't just music, he was always thinking about what was going on at the time and even the peace symbol. I mean, it, it's such an incredible story for him to see <coughs> this peace symbol and know that it was going to mean something and to photograph it over a 10 year period was, was qu quite incredible. Um, so I think Jim, was always thinking and he was like how can i communicate what's going on in the world to everybody mm. and uh and i think that's was his gift it's really <laughs> funny you say that because if people don't forget the people that people that we idolize now like the stones joplin hendrix credence clearwater grateful dead they were unknown bands they were like your bands just in the neighborhood weren't they they were just like no one knew that they never knew they were going to be that famous but I think, he, as someone said, which is not in here, one of the interviewers, he said Jim had ears, and he knew the bands that were going to do well, all the individual artists. So 
he actually loved music. And that doesn't take away from the fact that he was a documentarian, but he knew he can hear if someone was going to be, this person's special. Because yeah. when he was at um, Monterey Pop, they have a lot of filler bands. You know, like if you go to a concert or a festival, there's the wannabes and the ones who want to be somebody. And you know they're not going to be that great, but they, they get them on stage to sort of prep, prep you for the big acts. Jim wouldn't photograph those. He would wait and then wait for the big guys to come on. And then he'd know. I mean, the stuff that he did with um, Otis Redding, which we... <laughs> painful that we couldn't use the footage because it just it got too expensive but there's some incredible footage when he had this amazing green suit and he just killed it and Jim says in one of the inter in the interviews which we couldn't include because without that footage we couldn't use it he said he was so amazed at this guy this big guy and he sang and he just tore the place up and one of the Rolling Stones says we got to go on after him no, 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 it wasn't the Rolling Stones who was yeah, it who said that it was the Rolling Stones but yeah. So Otis Redding was huge. He was like a six, six foot, foot four, four. Big and he had this lime, lime green like lizard suit on, um, and he came out like a bat out of hell. Yeah. And everybody was amazed. And so Brian Jones was there as Brian That's Jones, it. and he was sitting next to Mama Cass Elliot. And after that, he looked at her and he said, "You know, I'm with the Rolling Stones, the biggest band in the world. I wouldn't even follow that act. It was that good." So. And questions from the audience, please. Yeah. So, uh, could, Hang you on, just you wait. Just, could you just wait for the mic? It's just on this way. Yeah, first of all, congratulations. I thought it was a superb documentary. Well, thank, thank you so um, much. To everyone. I, I've got two questions. You mentioned as director uh, that some things are expensive. And one of the things that was a bit missing from the documentary was music. There was some music, you had a bit of Dylan, the Chamber Brothers, whatever, but there was no Coltrane, there was no Miles Davis. There I was can, yeah. a lack of music. That's oh, my uh, first question. I kind of have to sort of disagree. There's a score. <laughs> And what I didn't want to do was make it a jukebox of the period. So every time, because that can actually distract from the story. So if every minute you're going, oh my God, I remember that song, you're getting turned away from the film. And it was a kind of creative decision to go, and I think it was brave on everybody's part. <laughs> to go. And Ian Arbor, the composer, has 85%. And that's unheard of in a film to, of a composer to have that much, especially for a doc. And I think I, I thought he needs a theme. The periods need a theme. And when Adam, Ian, myself, Amelia, Benita, and Tatiana, we, all, we, all, we had a meeting in London and we, we sat around. And I said, well, it's got to be almost like a... Uh, Kind of like a big, a big piece that weaves through the film. That we, we, you know, there's periods that you can hear. Here, the music is different, and that denotes sixties, seventies, out of the seventies. And if you try to fit music in from all those periods, it really is distracting. And the music that's in there is relevant to Jim's life. It's relevant to things that he did and the people he worked with. So you know, okay, this, the, you. And yes, it is expensive. But even if we had all the money. I don't wouldn't I would have made the same decision. Would have had more strings. But <laughs> you know, <clears throat> that, it would have been that decision, excuse me. Because I think it just it, it, it makes it separates it from the docs that I find them a little bit it's just an easy trope to use just to fill it with music from that period. Well and I think also we, we decided not to use uh, <coughs> we had some photographers and some musicians. Yeah. But we really didn't want to use a lot of musicians or a lot of photographers for the same reason, because then it becomes more about them and their, you know, their music or their photographs. And we really wanted to focus on Jim as a human being, as a man, and what he did. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm really happy and proud of what we did as a collective because I think it it really does show you all of Jim, who he was, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything. Because remember, he's not known as you see him here, because people didn't know that, you didn't recognize the photos, you don't recognize the man. And I have to reiterate, what, there were people that we could have interviewed, we just said no. And it was nice saying no to Mick Jagger, actually. 
Right, can, can I? Yes, we did. Yeah, because he he got a little bit difficult, but <laughs> it was not in a not in that way. It was just it was nice not not to vote. We could have interviewed those people, but they were coming off tour, and then they were ready, and it was blah 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 blah. And then we realized, and we were all talking, and Adam and we all looked at them. And go, these guys look at their prime now in these photos. They looked amazing. They get wheeled out all the time. And you get Keith Richard, who you can, you know, would need subtitles now. But, you know, it's, it's, he's amazing, but it's too, it's, it's, we want to show them at a period of their life when they were on fire, and they were. You could not believe what they were. Can you imagine seeing them then? I would have been amazed to see them then at the height of their power. Now they're, you know. Could I just come back on one tiny little question about... <laughs> I like this guy. It was mentioned, <laughs> yeah. the background of Jim. Now, um, there was one thing that seemed to be missing, a tiny thing, and maybe you can explain. There was not much about his mother, his father, where he grew up. Can you fill in a bit on that? Because that seemed well, there, to be there missing a bit. There was, perhaps actually. Deliberately. There was a... We did include um, things about where he grew up and, and his mother and his father, but also that was something that Jim didn't share um, a lot of. So because it was a difficult part of his, his life. Um, so we really talked a little bit about that, but yeah. then it's more about the photos that he ended up taking reflect how he grew up and how he felt and the experiences he had. So I think you know it, it's you discover Jim the man and who he was through the photographs that he took over his his lifespan. So um, I think we did kind of address that through the photographs themselves and a couple of the interviews because Mike mm -hmm. uh, Michael Zigaris clearly says that he asked him about his child and he goes, "What are you? You know, I'm not fucking psycho." You know, he wanted to block. He that was his past, which was painful. And he was thinking, now I'm here now, and I've got to do this. And as you can see, he did suffer for his art, as we spoke earlier. Uh, yes, uh, gentleman here. You want, could you wait for Could you wait for the mic? Thanks. I'm interested in your editing choices about the chronology of the film, because it's it's not in chronological order, and that's no. clearly a quite an important strategic decision. Would you like to? talk about how you can well, the right behind you <laughs> <laughs> no well we decided I I well I remember when Amina and I spoke and I said the thing that I remember was pretty much from the get-go I wanted to start with Jim's death and I wanted to end with the film and his high the middle bit we didn't know <laughs> we weren't sure what that whole from the beginning to the end it was a mystery how we were going to do it and I definitely didn't want it to be um, linear to the point where it's just like he did this and did that, blah, 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 and he died. No, because he's as Mina will tell you that Jim wasn't that kind of character. So there's a little jumping around, well, but no, not no, too much. But it's enough that you, it's not for me. Well, maybe f well, it's not for me that it's distracting to the point where you don't get where you're going down the road. And our lives. So someone asked me a question about my first film. How do you make it? I said I don't know. I remember I got asked to do something. I never knew where my life would take me to get to this. It went here, down, up, around, along, boom, and then I ended up doing my first film. And I got invited to an event, blah, 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 da, 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 because my, yeah. things are not straight, generally in life. I want to buy a house, and then this happens, this fails, this, da, 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 boom, boom, and then I get my house down the line. That's life and I think that's the way it was edited that it's not about making it and I don't mean this to be rude making it idiot proof so you just see it from one end to the other because you're also, very intelligent and I know that you would get what's going on up there but if if you knew Jim and you it was very much like Jim it was like being with Jim because when you went in his house you never knew what was going to happen you never knew what you you know Jim would be pulling out proof sheets and then the phone would ring and he'd start talking to somebody and then he said, get me a glass of whiskey and then, oh, wait a minute, I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, wait a minute, we're going to go have lunch with somebody. So it was very much like that and I think the decision to mix it up in that sense, it, it really portrayed Jim as a human, but what it was like being around Jim. And so you were never, you were always on your toes and I think there's so much information in the documentary that 
keeping you on your toes, that decision <laughs> to, to keep mixing it up, it yeah. kept you there, right? Because you, d you couldn't fall asleep. You were on this roller coaster ride with Jim Marshall. And, you know, he may have been there for the music, but other things were happening from the music as well. So even though he was there at Newport Folk Festival, Joan Baez, they were also doing a trial march on, you know, on Washington through the Newport Folk Festival. So he may have been there for a specific thing, but all these <laughs> other cob, you know, webs of a spider web came out of that. And, and, and I think um, Adam and, and Alfred's decision to do it in that way really um, holds true to who Jim was. And also I could tell you a really, Thank really, you. really quick thing, which will do a little behind the scenes of the editing. So, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a horrible trick we played on the composer, Ian. So one day I went over to Ian's, because Ian Arbor, the composer, lives close to me, we're quite neighbors, and, and we were stuck in a moment, and it was a difficult section of the film, and the music he composed wasn't working, and these things happen, it just happens, it's not, you know. So I went over to him, he said, leave it with me, blah, 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 blah. And then we we, we sort of like decided just to wrap it up and then we I went, turned up at Adam's place and we, we sat in front of the computer, it was early in the morning, we we're getting ready. He said, yeah, Ian's gonna send over a track. And then he sent it over, Adam, <laughs> downloaded it, we looked at it, and we listened to it, and Adam looked at me and went, whoa. I looked at him and I, we just couldn't believe it. It was perfect for the for the section. It's the section that's in Altamont. And actually, that was originally was in a different place. So we Adam took it and just moved it to there. He looked at me, I looked at him, and it actually solved the problem. We were stuck. And these things happened, and the music actually helped us to move forward. So Ian calls and said, how was it? And we went, it's not quite, it's not quite, you haven't quite got it yet. Can, and, <laughs> he was, and then it was a long silence on the phone because he thought we were being serious. And then I couldn't hold it, so I started to chuckle. He could hear me in the background, but he, he nailed it. Well, what we thought was great. So these are the little things that happen where Ian was on really early, and I love a composer being on early because Adam's an editor who's, in, who's done a lot of music. I was a musician and I'm and I love music and music was another character in the film. Jim loved music. So it really worked and he you know, I just think that part is my favourite section, the Altamont with all the strings, and it was the end of an era, the death of Meredith Hunter at Altamont, that ended it all. You moved into the seventies and all corporations took over. And, you know, music changed and the whole scene changed forever. Um, I think I'm right in saying that we don't have any time for any more questions, unfortunately. One more? Is that, was, yeah, did you want to ask one question? Okay. Very, 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 the last one, very quickly. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, when he's uh, being questioned about his uh, mental illness and his aggressive behavior and, and how come he can be aggressive and at the same time sensitive, uh, I think it's in the beginning of the, of the film, yeah. um, he just says, I'm not sensitive, I'm just technically good. <laughs> And from your perspective, uh, how much of that is true? From my perspective? Uh, both of you. Um, well, from my, my perspective, he, he was extremely sensitive. He really was. Um, and I think that was um, a front to say that, um, because he couldn't have gotten those photographs of the coal miners in Hazard, Kentucky, if he didn't feel for them. Um, so I think a lot of it for him was just a front. He, he didn't. He didn't want people to know how sensitive he was because he didn't want to be hurt. And so um, for me, during my time with Jim, he really would only show his music photography because he knew that would sell and people would be like, this is amazing, this is great. Um, I think he was afraid to show the more sensitive photography that he did because it was so personal. And if he did show it to people and people didn't like it, he would be devastated. So since he is gone and there isn't that roadblock, we're showing it. And that is that is what I'm trying to do, is show the many sides of Jim and show how sensitive he was and how he was able to capture moments in, in history. And it's funny, when we're being interviewed, sorry, I don't mean to, I mean, when uh, I got the project, Amelia said, what kind of film do you want to make? And I said, it's a story of a man's life, not the fact, I mean, it's him, it's Jim. He got to tell his story and I don't know, I'm underscoring and, and sort of like dotting the T's and crossing the I's, but I've looked at his work and you, for someone to be that um, 
comfortable around someone with a camera and also allow them to see the most sensitive sides. They're going on stage and they may not want to go on. They may be really scared, no matter how big you are. They may be like, I've thrown up and I'm going to go on. And then Jim's sitting there, someone's having a drink, someone's doing this, and then, you know, they they, they, they got to go on. But he captured that. And that's a gift. And he's mirroring stuff in himself through them. Okay, unfortunately, we could talk a lot longer, as you can see. But Sorry. Um, uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> do join, it's a wonderful film. Do join me in thanking Amelia and Alfred. Thank you. And, and everybody, please, if you enjoyed the film, um, please go on to Rotten Tomatoes. Tomat no, Rotten tomatoes. Tomatoes, <laughs> tomatoes, as I would say. And please do social media, because the way these yeah. documentaries are known is through all of you, um, you know, going on social media and saying it's a great thing. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.